What's up, YouTube people? Shaggy the Writer coming at you with the quickest stream I've had in quite some time. I didn't even send this to anybody. We literally have 30 minutes until the library closes because I thought they closed at 7. Uh, they do not. So, we're doing a quick introduction to Leo Tolstoy today. We're going to do um, legit about a page and a half worth of bio and then God sees the truth but waits. Uh, so, if you are interested in more classic literature, I'll just smash that like button. But Leo Tolstoy was born Count Leov Nikolaev Tolstoy on the 9th of September, 1828, into an aristocratic Russian family. Death was a constant in his early childhood. His mother, Mirya Nikolaevna, died before he turned two, and his father, Nikolai Tolstoy, died when he was only nine years old. His next two guardians, his grandmother and aunt, also died shortly after his father, leaving him and his siblings to live with his aunt in Kazan. Nonetheless, his first work was a dreamy and pleasant autobiography about his early years, entitled Destivo, published in 1852 under an alias in the Distinguished Sovereignic Journal. At University of Kazan, his reckless behavior resulted in his leaving before his studies were complete. He returned to Yasnaya Polena with the hopes of improving his estate teaching himself. He joined the army alongside his older brother and served in the Crimean War between 1853 and 1856. It was this experience that began his career as a short story writer. His first short story, The Raid, examined the nature of bravery and was soon followed by three pieces on the siege of Sevastopol. His fiction varied greatly, from exhilarating thriller, The Prisoner in the Caucasus, to the acclaimed novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. After vainly refusing to join the conversation, with other intellectuals, he lost all of his money while gambling in Paris in 1857. As a result, he was forced to return to Russia. He discovered a passion for pedagogy and opened a school for poor children. In 1862, he met and married Sofia Andreevna Bears, whose father was a respectable doctor in Moscow. With all of his attention now on his marriage and his writing, he was able to publish many works on ethical matters, such as Ochistro Yenost and Lucian. I am sorry, I'm probably butchering all these. What's up, Brittany? I'll be shouting you out in like every one of these. Uh, between 1863 and 1877, Tolstoy achieved his great success as a novelist. It was during this time he wrote both War and Peace and Anna Karenna, two of the most renowned novels of all time. After finishing Anna Karenna, he struggled with an intense existential crisis, which caused him to turn to religion. He wrote several pieces between 1880 and 1844, including an examination of dogmatic theology in 1880 and the union and translation of four gospels in 1881, in which he criticized religious practices because he believed they obscured the message of Christ. His newfound fervor caused bitter conflict in his marriage. In 1910, Tolstoy left his mother, dying soon after from pneumonia and heart failure at a railroad station at Astapovo. He was like in his 80s, too. But yes, yeah, shouts out, Brit, shouts out, Rock. I literally have like 30 minutes here. Um, so just all kinds of love to you showing up. I literally just gave your brother a copy of uh, Chinua and Chibe. So. <laughs> but uh, this is nine pages, and I literally have 25 minutes. But it's small, small print. And this is called God Sees the Truth, but Waits. In the town of Vladimir lived a young merchant named Ivan Dermatich Esneov. He had two shops in a house of his own. Esneov was a handsome, fair haired, curly headed fellow, full of fun and very fond of singing. When a quiet young man he had been given too drunk was a riotous when he had too much. But after he married, he gave up drinking except now and then. On the summer, Asneyov was going to the Nitsi fair and he bade goodbye to his wife and family. And his wife said to him, 
I win geometry which do not start today. I had a bad dream about you. As Nayaf laughed and said, You are afraid that when I get a pool bear, I shall go on the spring. His wife replied, I do not know what you think I am afraid of. All I know is that I had a bad dream. I dreamt that you returned from town, and when you took off your cap, I saw your hair was quite gray. As Nayaf laughed, that's a lucky sign, said he. See if I don't sell out all my goods and bring you some presents from the fair. So he said goodbye and his family, and he drove away. He traveled halfway. He met a merchant whom he knew, and they put in the same inn for the night. They had some tea together. They went to bed in adjoining rooms. It was not Asnayov's habits to sleep late, and wishing to travel while it was still cool, he aroused his driver before dawn and told him to put in the horses. Then he made his way across to the landlord of the inn, who lived in the cottage at the back, paid his bill, and continued on his journey. When he had gone about twenty-five miles, he stopped for the horses to be fed. Asnayov rested a while in his passage of the inn. Then he stepped out of the porch and, ordering a samurai to be heated, got out his guitar and began to play. Suddenly, a troyoka drove up with tinkling bells and an official alighted, followed by two soldiers. He came to Asnayov and began to question him, asking him who he was and whence he came. And Asnayov answered of him fully and said, Won't you have some tea with me? But the official went on cross-questioning him and asking him, Where did you spend his night last night? Were you alone or with a fellow merchant? Did you see the other merchant this morning? Why did you leave the inn before dawn? Was I walked away? <laughs> I actually I wonder why he was asked all these questions. But he asked... As he described all that happened and then added, Why do you cross question me as if I were a thief or a robber? I am traveling on business of my own. There is no need to question me. Then the official calling in the soldier said, I am the police officer of the district. I questioned you because the merchant with whom you spent the night last night has been found with his throat cut. We must search your things. Uh -oh. They entered the house. The soldiers and the police officer unstrapped Asnayov's luggage and searched it. Suddenly, the officer drew a knife out of a bag, crying, Whose knife is this? Asnayov looked, and seeing a blood-saved knife taken from the bag, he was frightened. How is there blood on this knife? Asnayov tried to answer, but he could hardly utter a word and only stammered, I, I don't know. It's not mine. Then the police officer said, this morning, the merchant who was found in bed with his throat cut, you are the only person who could have done it. The house was locked from inside, and no one else was there. There is a bloodstained knife in your bag, and your face and manner betray you. Tell me how you killed him and how much money you stole. Asnayov swore he had not done it. Then he had not seen the merchant after they had tea together. They had no money except 8,000 rubles of his own, and that the knife was not his. But his voice was broken, his face pale, he trembled with fear as though he were guilty. The police officer ordered the soldiers to blind Asnayov and put him in the cart. They tied his feet together and flung him into the cart, and Asnayov crossed himself and wept. His money and goods were taken from him, and he was sent to the nearest town and imprisoned there. Inquiries as to his character were made at Vladimir. The merchants and other inhabitants of that town said that in former days he used to drink and waste his time, but that he was a good man. Then the trial came on. He was charged with murdering a merchant from Razian and robbing him of 20,000 rubles. His wife was in despair. He didn't know what to believe. Her children were all quite small. One was a baby at her breast. Taking them all with her, she went down to the town where her husband was in Gull. At first, she was not allowed to see him, but after much begging... She obtained permission from the officials and was taken to him. When she saw her husband in prison dress and chains, shut up with thieves and criminals, she fell down. It did not come to her senses for a long time. Then she drew her children to her and sat down near him. She told him of things at home and asked him what happened to him, and he told her all, and she asked, well, What can we do now? We must position the Tsar not to let an innocent man perish. His wife told him that she sent the petition to the Tsar, but that it had not been accepted. Askinov did not reply, but only looked downcast. His wife said, 
You were all for nothing. I dreamt your hair turned grey. You remember? You should have not started that day. And passing her fingers through his hair, she said, On your dearest, tell your wife the truth. Was it not you who did it? So you too suspect me, said Asnayar, holding his face in his hands. He began to wept. But then the soldier came to say that his wife and children must go away. And Asnayar said goodbye to his family for one last time. They were gone. Asnayar recalled what had been said. And when he remembered what his wife had also suspected him, he said to himself, It seems that only God can know the truth. It is him who is his appeal from him alone to expect mercy. And Asnayev wrote no more petitions, gave up all hope, and only prayed to God. Asnayev was condemned to be flogged and sent to the mines. So he was flogged with the cop and sent to the mines, made where the cop were healed. And he was driven to Siberia with other convicts. For 26 years, Asnayev lived in Siberia as a convict. His hair turned white as snow. His beard grew long, thin, and gray. All his mirth went, he stooped, he walked slowly, spoke little, and never laughed, but he often prayed. In prison, Asnayov learned to make books and earned a little money, in which he bought the lives of saints and read the book when there was enough light in the prison. On Sundays in the prison church, he read the lessons and sang the choir, for his voice was still good. The prison authorities liked Asnayov for his meekness, and a few prisoners respected him and called him grandfather and the saint. When they wanted to petition the prison authorities about anything, they always made Asnayov their spokesman. And when there were quarrels among the prisoners, they came to him and put things right and judged the matter. No news reached Asnayov of his home, and he did not even know from his wife and children if they were still alive. One day, a fresh gang of convicts came into the prison. In the evening, the old prisoners collected around the new ones and asked them what towns and villages they came from and what they were sentenced for. Among the rest of Asnayov, sat down near the newcomers and listened with a downcast air of what was said. One of the new convicts, a tall, strong man of sixty, with a closely cropped gray beard, was telling the others what he had been arrested for. Well, friends, he said, I only took a horse what was tied up to the sledge and I arrested and accused of stealing it. I said I had only taken it to get home quicker and then he let it go. Besides, the driver was a friend of mine, so I said, it's all right. No, they said, you stole it. But how aware I stole it, they could not say. And once I really did go something wrong, I ought to have rights to have come here long ago. But that time I was not found out. Now I'm telling you, now I've been staying here for nothing at all. Hey, it's with lies, I'm telling you. I've been to Siberia before. I did not stay long. Where are you from? Asked someone. From Vladimir. My family are from that town. My name is Makar, but they also call me Smyrnovich. Asnayov raised his head and said, Tell me, Smyrnovich, do you know anything of the merchants? Asnayov of Vladimir, are they still alive? No, of course I do. The Asnayovs have reached, though their father is in Siberia. A sinner likewise ourselves, it seems. As for you, granted, I don't know. How'd you got me? Asnayov did not speak of his misfortune. He only sighed and said, For my sins, I've been sent to prison these 26 years. What sins? asked Mikhar Shmiyovich. But Asnayov only said, Well, I must have disturbed it. Don't want to interrupt you. We called about 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Nope. Shouts out the library staff being awesome. Um, <clears throat> he would have said no more, but his companions told the newcomer how Asnayov came to be in Siberia, how someone had killed a merchant, how he put a knife among Asnayov's things, and Asnayov had been unjustly condemned. When Makar Smenoyevich heard this, he looked at Asnayov, slapped his own knee, and exclaimed, Well, this is wonderful, really wonderful. How old you grown, Granddad? The others asked him why he was so surprised when he had only seen Asnayev before. But Makar Spinoyevich did not reply. He only said, It's a wonderful that we should meet here, lads. The words make Asnayev wonder whether this man knew who had killed the merchant. So he said, Perhaps, Spinoyevich, you've heard of the affair, or perhaps you've seen me before. 
how could I help hearing the world's full of rumours but it's long ago I forgot what I've had. Perhaps you heard who killed the merchant, said Asnav. Maya Kars and Moivis laughed and replied, It must have been him whose bag in North was found. If someone else had hit the North in there, he's not a thief till it gets stuck, as the saying is. How could anyone put a North in your bag? Or it was under your head. He would have surely woke you up. When Asnav heard these words, he felt sure this was the man who had killed the merchant. He rose and went away. All that night, Asnay off when he awake. He felt terribly unhappy, and all sorts of images arose in his mind. There was the image of his wife when she had parted for her to go on the affair. He saw her as if she were present. Her face and eyes rose before him. He heard her speak and laugh. Then he saw his children, quite little as they were at the time, one with a little cloak on, another at his mother's breast. Then he remembered himself, and he used to be young and merry. He remembered how he sat playing the guitar in the porch in the inn where he was arrested and how free from care he had been. He saw in his mind the place where he had been flogged, the executioner, the people standing around the chains, the convicts, all of the 26 years of his prison life and his premature old age, and the thought of it made him wretched so that he was ready to kill himself. It's all that villain's doing, thought Asnayov. His anger was so great against Makar Spanyovich that he longed for vengeance and even he should perish for it. He kept repeating prayers all night, but could get no peace. During that day, he could not get near Makar Shmanyoyevich, or even look at him. A fortnight passed this way. Askinov could not sleep at nights. He was so miserable that he did not know what to do. One night, as he was walking about the prison, he noticed some earth that came rolling out from under one of the shelves on which the prisoners slept. He stopped to see what it was. Suddenly, Makar Shmanyoyevich crept out from under the shelf and looked up at Asnayov in a frightened face. Asnayov tried to pass without looking at him, but Makar seized his hand and told him that he had dug a hole under the wall, getting rid of the earth by putting it into his high boots and emptying it every day on the road where the prisoners had driven to their work. Just you keep quiet, old man, and you should get out too. If you blab, they'll flog the life out of me, but I will kill you first. Asnayov trembled with anger as he looked at his enemy. He drew his hand away, saying, I have no wish to escape, and you have no need to kill me. You killed me long ago. As to telling you, I may do so or not, as God shall direct. The next day, when the convicts were led out to work, the convoy of soldiers noticed that one of their prisoners emptied some earth out of his boots. The prisoner was searched, and the tunnel was found. The governor came and questioned all the prisoners to find out who had dug the hole. They all denied any knowledge of it. Those who knew would not betray Makar Spinovich, knowing that he would be flogged almost to death. At last, the governor turned to Asnayov, whom he knew to be a just man, and said, You are truthful, old man. Tell me before God, who dug the hole? Makar Spinovich stood as if he were quite unconcerned. Looking at the governor and not so much glancing at Asnayov, Asnayov's lips and hands trembled. For a long time he could not under a word. He thought, why should I screen him who ruined my life? Let him pay for what I have suffered. But if I tell, they will probably flog the life off him, and maybe I suspect him wrongly. And after all, what good would it be to me? Well, old man, repeated the governor, tell us the truth. Who has been digging under the well? Asnayov glanced at Makar Spinovich and said, I cannot say, Your Honor. It is not God's will that I should tell. Do what you like with me. I am in your hands. However much the governor tried, Asnayov would say no more. And so that matter had to be left. And that night when Asnayov was laying in his bed, just beginning to doze, someone came quietly and sat down on his bed. He cleared, peered through the darkness and recognized Makar. What do you want of me? said Asnav. Why have you come here? Makar Sminyoyevich was silent. So Asnav sat up and said, What do you want? Go away or I will call the guard. Makar Sminyoyevich bent close over Asnav and whispered, 
Ivan Dmitrievich, forgive me. What for? As asked now. Before it was I who killed the merchant, he did knife around your things. I meant to kill you too, but I heard the noise outside and hid the knife in your bag and escaped out the window. Asanov was silent. He didn't know what to say. Makar Smenyoyevich slid off the bookshelf and knelt upon his ground. Orvin Dmitrievich, he said, forgive me. For the love of God, forgive me. I will confess that it was all who killed the merchant, and you will be released, and you can go home. That's easy enough for you to ask, said Asinov, but I have suffered for these 26 years. Where could I go now? My wife is dead and my children have forgotten me. I have nowhere to go. Makar Spanyoyevich did not rise, but beat his head on the floor. Orvin Dmitrievich, forgive me, he cried. When they stoked me with the knout, it was not so hard to bear as it is to see you now. Yet you had pity on me and you did not tell. For Christ's sake, forgive me, wretch that I am. And he began to sob. And Askinov heard him sobbing. He too began to weep. God will forgive you, said he. Maybe I am a hundred times worse. And at these words, his height grew a little lighter. And longing for hope left him. He had no longer had any desire to leave the prison, but only hoped for his last hour to come. In spite of which Askneov had said, Makar Smenyoyevich confessed to his guilt. And when the order for his release came, Askneov was already dead. Well, there you go. That was sad. It was so sad. That actually going to hurt a little bit. But there's your introduction. Tolstoy. We're going to come back with more of that later on. Because it's good to feel things. So. Thank you so much for. Brittany coming by. Smashing the like button. Shouts out Brittany. Rakim. Octawave against the world chief. Don't watch continue dog rose the fine folks over at the r slash alternate history hub. As well as a whole bunch of other people who are awesome and consistently show up to these things. Thanks to the library staff. And uh, thanks to all the dope Virgos out there. We celebrating your season this year for sure. One love, y'all. Faith NFA. One love. We out. <laughs>